species because you really have to understand um, tree range to understand mushroom habitat. So because a lot of, especially the edible mushrooms you're eating, they're dependent, they're growing symbiotically with a lot of these tree species. So you're not going to go to um, cedar woods and look for chanterelles because they do not occur there. So just throwing in a few of them, Coast Live Oak, San Francisco Bay Area is right here. It goes up to southern Mendocino County. So this is the Mendocino County line. Uh, as you see, you do not have Coast Live Oak inland here, but you do have a couple other species, you know, Imperial and Canyon Live Oak, and they get a lot of similar mushrooms. But this is the tree of Southern California. So you get these oak woodlands all through the mountains out in Southern California, and just right off the coast zone through, you know, through most of Central and and. So I consider, being from Massachusetts, I consider San Francisco to be Central California. Um, there's 400 plus miles north of there, which is Northern California. And I know people in San Francisco especially see things differently, but try driving up to Humboldt County and see how long it takes you. Uh, the live oak zone is completely like, it's mirrored on the northern half by the coast redwoods. So they kind of, they start in the canyons in Monterey County and Big Sur really start getting established north of um, Kings Valley and stuff, and, you know, southern Santa Cruz County, and then that's, you know, a lot of the coastal tree. It doesn't occur on the Lost Coast because of the way the fog and the, the mountains are right up next to the coast, and it doesn't get the fog in that area that the redwoods need to survive. So this is more of a spruce Douglas Burt Tan Oak zone. Um, and then, fortunately, it's like all blurry, but this is, this is um, Douglas Burr, which as you can see, all over the coast and all over the mountains of California. That one doesn't really care what's growing. The Tan Oak coastal tree with this remnant pocket, Bullard's Bar area, that's about it for the, the Tan Oak distribution in the Sierra. So you really have a, a special habitat in this area <coughs> because this is a really good mushroom tree. And then um, the Madrone is scattered through the Sierra as well, but it's, it's mostly a coastal tree. And there's a few other examples of the northern conifer zone along the far north coast. So Humboldt County uh, with a couple pockets of Mendocino County. Uh, same thing with the Grand Fur and Western Hemlock. So these, this is like a completely different zone. Uh, this northern conifer zone is the Pacific Northwest zone, which in California is restricted to these, you know, this strip of coastal forest. So I'll start with the coast. Um, so this is where I've been working, um, like I said, for the past, this is my sixth winter out here. So the, the coast season runs from about mid-October up north um, until February, March down south. Uh, with, the, with the majority of the peak in, in the north is November, uh, starts like, you know, starts Mendocino County early to mid-November and goes, you know, edibles keep going throughout the year, but diversity through December, and then like the Bay Area down to Santa Cruz starts late November, early December, runs through January, and as you go further south, the season is just a little bit later. Southern California, the peak is usually mid-February. So you can just follow, you follow the mushrooms down the coast as they're fruiting. Um, but it, it's giving me an excuse to be in the woods pretty much full time. Um, and when the mushrooms are fruiting, I'm pretty much out there every single day. In the past, you know, I've probably photographed close to 2,000 species for California so far. Probably only about 12 to 1,500 of those have names, so we have a lot of work to do. Um, there's a lot of undescribed species of mushrooms in California, or mushrooms using incorrect names. Uh, so this book is going to have 750, you know, illustrated species. I mentioned about 500 more just for the north coast from, from Monterey County northward to Oregon. So the second volume will be for your, your mountain fungi, and that, that'll be about 500 additional species. So it's due out in early 2016 with 10 speed press. So this is the far north coast. Uh, you know, the really wet redwood forest. There's not too many old roads with redwoods left, unfortunately. Um, <coughs> and forest management up there, I mean, leaving these old roads forests completely undisturbed has really changed the mycophlora in there because they used to burn every once in a while. You can see all the burn scars in these older trees. Uh, and that burning cleared out the understory 
and now they don't allow it to burn, and it gets really thick, especially with the sword ferns and huckleberry, and so it's really choking out a lot of the species that, you know, occurred in these naturally disturbed forests. This is the southern end of the redwood zone in um, southern Monterey County, and the only spots that occur there are these really steep, foggy canyons, um, because, you know, it's the only spot that will hold enough moisture in the summer. The redwoods do not like hot, they do not like dry, um, so you get these stunted little redwoods in these canyons down there. And the work we've done down there shows that a lot of the, the species that occur up north also occur down there. We got range extensions of a lot of species of hundreds of miles when we were doing work down there, mostly because people didn't look for these mushrooms down there. Uh, this is like, this is typical north coast forest, which is really diverse, uh, you know, big leaf maple, alder, redwood, spruce, fir, hemlock, douglas fir, tan oak, madrone as you go a little bit more inland. Uh, so you can, on the north coast, you can go out there and find 300 plus species in a day when it's fruiting. You can't do that around here. And the main reason for that is because it's a lot wetter there and you have a lot bigger diversity with trees. So I'm going to start with the mushrooms of the redwood forest. These are not all of these are endemic to redwoods, but a lot of they definitely have a preference for, and some of them are restricted to the redwoods. And the main group is the, the hygrosophy, mm -hmm. the waxy caps. So these are the brightly colored things. We only have three different species on the table here. We have very low diversity of these in the Sierra, but very high diversity on the, in the redwood forest and the California Bay laurel forest on the coast. Um, so this particular group, I mean, you have, like I said, as you can see, lots of bright colors. And then this group, the entolomas, or this group is called the, the leptonias, which is a subgenus within, within uh, entoloma. Uh, once again, there's one species of these on the table. You can, you know, if you were on the coast right now, you would find 15 or 20 from the collecting you guys did yesterday. So some of them, just to highlight a few of them, the scarlet waxy cap, the grassy coccinia. And the problem with these is we now know, based on genetic work, and the fact that we have colored photographs available at our fingertips from all around the world, that what we call Hygrosomy carcinia out here is a different species from Europe. So it eventually will get a new name, but it's our scarlet waxy cap. And the same is true of the parrot mushroom. Um, so the, you know, this is a really slimy green cap mushroom. Or the pink waxy cap. And then um, this one here is extremely rare. It's only known from about 10 different collections. Described from California, uh, from, from Prairie Creek Redwoods up in Humboldt County. And I'm really not seen again for about 30 years. But it's out there. It's just really rare. <coughs> Hydraspi virescens is this lime green one. This is the one that's not rare, but it rarely fruits. So it can go 10 plus years without fruiting, and then conditions will be right. It'll start showing up all over the place, and then, you know, disappear for the next 10 years. So this was a fruiting year for it in Mendocino. So it was a really nice fruiting of it. But yeah, I mean, most people can go their whole life without seeing this mushroom, even though they're out there. You know, David Largen, who did his work on, you know, he, he wrote the book on Hygrophoraceae of California, never saw this mushroom. So, you know, he's out there collecting every single day for 30 plus years from where this mushroom was described. And so this, this one did make the table excellent of Bloxamii. This one also is going to get a new name shortly. Uh, this is one of the bigger antelomas uh, that, you know, that midnight blue color pink spores. This one's edible, but it's not recommended that you eat it. And that's because there's poisonous antelomas that look similar. I'll have you know, I'll have your common easy to identify edibles later on. Redwood forests are not a spot to go if you're looking for edible mushrooms. <laughs> but if you want the little colorful ones, they are. Leptonia carnea is another one that's um, scattered throughout the redwoods and except for one record from Cyprus, restricted to redwoods. And there's some speck of something on this lens here that's blurring dot. Um, 
so so Latonia, like I said, the, the work that's been done in this group has been restricted to the far north part of California, and nobody's looked at the Latonia um, or you know work on Latonia of the Bay Area or Santa Cruz. So we get a lot of undescribed species in that area, including this one, which is going to soon get a name, and probably about 20 other species that need names. So a similar habit, as I mentioned, the you know, the Monterey cypress does have a bunch of crossover species, but then it also has a whole bunch of endemic species. So Monterey cypress originally was really, it had a really small range. Uh, you know, down in Mon Monterey County, Point Lobos area, a little bit in Pacific Grove, and then there's a, you know, some spots in San Mateo County, which is south of San Francisco, and that was pretty much it. But there's probably about 20 species of mushrooms which are endemic to these cypress trees. And a few of them, like um, Agaricus, Fuscofibulosis, Pattersonii, these things not only, I mean, are they restricted to cypress groves, there's probably only 10 or so spots this mushroom grows. It's very common in those spots, but, and it's a very good edible, but that's it. You know, that's the whole entire population of this mushroom. And so if you clear a few of those groves, which has happened, um, this thing could go extinct really quickly. And nobody would notice, because it's a mushroom. You know, if it was a spotted owl, we would raise millions of dollars to save it and do everything we could. But since it's a mushroom, people barely pay any attention to that. Question. Yep. Could that mushroom then be encouraged to grow where those sites have been planted? Yeah, side of their original and it range. does, and and so this is one that started doing that. So up in Mendocino County, where the cypress, um, you know, was all planted along the coast, this thing has started showing up there. So the spores have spread up there and spread to there, and a couple of the cypress, California cypress species of lepiotas have spread to France, where the cypress was planted. So yeah, I mean, they do, they can and will spread around, but a lot of these need these larger, dark, dense cypress groves, not just one or two trees. So this was one little cypress grove, probably, you know, a, a spot about half the size of this room, where when I went there, there was, you know, there were seven different kinds of agaricus, but but these three right here are restricted to the cypress. The Prince Agaricus Augustus will grow in a lot of different habitats. Uh, so Agaricus fuscofibulosis, this is going to get a new name shortly uh, because the California one is different from the European species, and, and remarkably so. Uh, if you saw photos of them together, it's like, oh, those are really different. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, when the work was being done 20, 30 years ago, you had a description uh, with no picture, and that's what you had to compare to your specimen. And now we have colored photographs and DNA sequencing which made things a lot clearer and a lot easier to work on. Uh, so this particular one, as you can see, stains red when you cut it. Um, very good edible. One of the better edible, I mean, if you compare this to the sorbot white button mushroom, which is related, uh, you'll probably never eat that mushroom again. It's, I mean, white button mushrooms are pretty bad, especially when you compare them to wild agaricus. Um, Agaricus lilaceps was another cypress species. This thing gets giant caps over a foot across are common. And this one has spread to planted eucalyptus. So here was a cypress species that found a new habitat that not very many mushrooms were taking advantage of and started growing in it. Um, so Agaricus augustus, or the prince, and a few of these photos in here are, are Christians, and his name will be on him. He's a co-author of mine for the Redwood Coast book. Uh, so this, you know, this one not very common in the mountains, but really common on the coast, especially in the summer with fog drift. So it doesn't need very much moisture to fruit. It has, you know, these brownish scales in the cap, this shaggy stalk, and this big, you know, skirt-like veil, and a sweet almond odor to it, and very good edible. And these are two examples of two introduced species. So this is Agaricus bispora, so your white button mushroom store, your portabella. Um, this is a wild form of it in California. And Agaricus like xanthodermis, which is the, the yellow stain in Agaricus, you can see here in the cap where it's been rubbed, it goes yellow really quickly. This thing was introduced from Europe. And what's happened is these two native species, Agaricus agrinferis and Californicus, are being pushed out of their normal habitat 
and really, you know, set to the fringe because they're not they're not quick growers. They don't have the ability to colonize and establish an area really quickly, but these two species do. I mean, that's where this one, the, one of the main reasons it's, it's, it's commercially grown is how quickly it'll grow and, you know, how easy it is to get the fruit. When, like, stuff like the, you know, the prince, this one, even though it has a flavor far superior, it's not very easy to grow and it takes a long time to get the fruit. Um, Rick Kerrigan, the agaricus expert in, in North America, works in, in Pennsylvania for, you know, in the, in the mushroom cultivation capital of the world, works for these, um, you know, these agaricus by sports, the white button mushroom um, growers, and they, they play around with trying to get these other species of agaricus to, to fruit and, and grow, um, but they have had a lot of problems getting stuff like this to grow in a, in a viable manner. So these things here, these non-native species come in and take over the habitat where these native species are, and these are becoming quite rare now as this spreads across California. It just got to Humboldt County about three years ago, and this year was pretty much in every single yard up there. You know, this was a mushroom that two years ago I saw under a cypress um, at HSU Humboldt State University. Last year I was there in a couple, you know, a couple yards. This year any unkept yard, you know, any yard that was like mowed every once in a while with a lot of grass had this mushroom, and just hundreds of them. So very quick to establish, very quick to grow. Um, so this is one of the, these Luco agaricus um, decoratus, this northwest species, this is close to it, CF, it kind of means like close, but not quite. Uh, so this, this is one that needs a new name. Um, but a beautiful cypress species that's quite common in those cypress groves. Some of the larger lithiotoid fungi, the shaggy parasols, these a lot of people eat. Um, this one's well established in California. This one's been introduced in the past few years and starting to take off. It's well established in the Northwest. But these are, these are some, you know, these are, this one's probably, maybe, no, it's probably not. It's okay. So it grows in it grows in watered lawns. I was gonna say it may have been native to Southern California, but there was no watered lawns before people got here. It's a it's a it's a species that occurs around tropical and subtropical areas around the world in grass. But there was no grass in Southern California before people got there. It's desert. Um, so I mean, but this one's probably native to California. It's really tough to tell with some of these urban wood chip. Um, duff species. But this one's really poisonous. These two are edible. So moving up to the north